All right, folks, here we are. We are once more in this monster, monster, monster chapter. Chapter three on in the book, uh, By What Standard? An Analysis of the uh, Philosophy of Cornelius Van Til. It is hard going, for me at least, um, and <laughs> perhaps it doesn't lend itself to the audiobook format as other books might but um it's definitely gonna yeah it's it's it definitely rewards um repeated listening and study so without much further ado we're gonna hit the uh, record button as it were so to speak for calvin Man's true knowledge of himself and his knowledge of God comes simultaneously. Since all knowledge is derived from analogical thinking on the basis of the revel... I wonder where levels like. Levels are look all right. I'm so... Glasses. Since all knowledge is derived from analogical thinking on the basis of the revelation of God in Scripture, and since all meaning is derived from God, true self-knowledge comes only as God is known. Thus, the traditional proofs of God meant little to Calvin. All right, we're just getting warmed up. It's all right. Thus, the traditional proofs of God meant little to Calvin in that they assumed that, on the basis of prior true knowledge, man advanced to the final knowledge of the existence of God. The arguments assume the neutrality of the mind, whereas Calvin was convinced of the enmity of the mind and man against God. Moreover, the proofs of God first assumed the independence of the mind of man and of natural facts from God, and thereby conceded to the opposition rather than advance the... Okay, I didn't quite get uh, the intended meaning there. And thereby conceded to the opposition rather than advance the theistic cause. Calvin's doctrine of God does justice to both transcendence and imminence, while giving priority to transcendence. God's nature and will are never separated. His will is always expressive of his nature, and, as a result, his activities are always completely personal. His insistence on the aseity of the Son is basic to his doctrine of the Trinity. No subordinationism is tolerated. The significance of this, Van Til has emphasised, quote, if there is any subordinationism, it implies that God is to be that. If there is any subordinationism, it implies that God is to that extent no longer this sole interpretive category of all reality. The nature of subordinationism that any system of theology retains in its doctrine of the Trinity is indicative of the measure of paganism in such a theology. Plato's independent sense world looms upon the horizon the moment subordination the moment subordinationism the moment sense world the moment subordinationism is given any place. End quote. In the modern era, the question of epistemology has come to the foreground in philosophy. Ostensibly, this is a bypassing of metaphysics and an elimination of God from philosophy as irrelevant. Actually, the full significance of the Christian theistic position is most clearly seen in the extent to which modern philosophy goes to eliminate an independent and sovereign God. The issues are more sharply drawn, therefore, between the consciousness of man and the consciousness of God as the frame of reference. In Descartes, Descartes, 
Une des cartes, des cartes, des cartes, des cartes. J'ai des cartes dans mon sac. Une des cartes, the ground of all certainty, is the human consciousness in independence, not only from the universe around him, but especially from God. For Calvin, the personality of man cannot be known nor can exist without the personality of God. For Descartes, nothing can be known without man's self-consciousness and personality in itself. The universe is a mechanistic one, and God merely the creator of the machine, now functioning in independence of him. The machine has its own laws and workings, and the inventor need not be known in order to understand the machine. The lives of the Wright brothers are of great interest to any student of the history of aviation, but utterly irrelevant to any understanding of the principles of flight or to the piloting of aircraft today. The Wright brothers created the first successful plane, but they did not create the principles of flight, which made that plane possible. They merely used them. The god of Descartes is ultimately in the same position. More than that, man rather than God is made the ultimate source of universal laws and interpretation. As a result of Descartes' point of departure, two lines of thought developed in philosophy, empiricism and rationalism. Empiricism holds that the individual man is the standard of truth and holds to the ultimacy of the sense world. The universals are purely subjective. The climax of such thought was a scepticism of Hume, for whom no knowledge was possible. Rationalism sought to interpret reality in terms of certain a priori principles. These a priori principles, however, were not anchored in the ontological trinity or in eternity, but in the human mind as ultimate. In Spinoza and Leibniz, rationalism reached its climax. For Spinoza, God... Man and the universe are but individuations and aspects of the general idea of substance. But, as Van Til has pointed out, to say that all is God is no different than saying nothing is God. Quote, Univocal reasoning must always lead to negation. Univocal reasoning is based upon negation. The very presupposition of univocal reasoning is that there is no absolute God. If there were an absolute God, it is ipso facto out of the question to apply the categories of thought to him in the same way that they are applied to man. End quote. I'm going to take a drink here. In a radical move, <clears throat> I'm going to take a drink. Before <clears throat> forced to do so, by my sound like Tom Waits. Yeah, Tom Waits. Leibniz sought individuation on the basis of complete description and by reduction to mathematical formulae. Revelation was thus an impossibility. The interpreter is the mind of man, not the mind of God, and the mind of man can wholly comprehend all reality. The equal ultimacy of the one and the many is sought without success in the universe, and the old theory of the gradation of being espoused. None of these devices enabled Leibniz to escape the dilemma of Spinoza or to rescue religion as he sought to do. Having begun with the ultimacy of the universe, he could do no more than attempt to analyse it into both God and man. Quote, As Leibniz sought to be wholly univocal, so Hume sought to be wholly equivocal in his reasoning. As in the philosophy of Leibniz, God lost his individuality in order to become wholly known, so in the philosophy of Hume, God maintained his individuality, but remained wholly unknown. End quote. Kant's solution to the question is a fusion of rationalism and empiricism. All rational and empirical data had disappeared, and the human consciousness faced an undifferentiated reality, dissolved either into unrelated sensations or faced as mysterious bulk. Kant's answer was not new. His radicalism was. Kant sought to save the objects, God and the world, 
by destroying the traditional conception of the subject-object relation and making autonomous man a macrocosm containing both God and the world. Because man was the interpreter, subjectivity, the old ghost-haunting philosophy, was ostensibly banished. Even as for Christian thought, the self-consciousness of the sovereign God has no problem of subjectivity in that it comprehends all things, having created and sustaining them, so in Kant subjectivity disappears only if it be granted that autonomous man replaces the ontological trinity and that in him being is exhausted in relation and that relation is exclusively internal. Philosophy previously had tended to fall into Kant's solution but had regarded it as defeat. Kant accepted it as the means to victory. To understand Kant's work, which was concerned with the problem of knowledge, it is necessary to see what he was contending against. Kant was concerned over the collapse of epistemology, over the reduction of knowledge to illusion in contemporary philosophy. He was thus attacking and superseding both empiricism and rationalism, empiricism for its acceptance of the validity of sensations as the source of all knowledge, and rationalism for its acceptance of innate ideas as needing no matter outside themselves. Yet again, in an unprecedented move, I'm going to take a drink. Drink it from the batter! <clears throat> the unhappy outcome of both schools was a wretched dualism between mind and matter, between the knower and brute factuality, the physical universe with no means of bridging the gap or establishing the validity of either sensations or reason. Kant's concern was epistemology, not metaphysics, not what is real, but what can we know. Kant eliminated from consideration the old approach as dogmatic, since it merely involved an attempt to trace ideas to their sources either innate ideas or sensations, in both instances the self having an essentially negative role. For Kant, the true approach is the transcendental or critical, the study of pure reason itself. Kant was concerned with establishing in reason that which had a universality beyond human experience, while yet necessary for it, reliable and applicable to the world of things, this method is transcendental because it is necessary to all experience, not because it transcends it. The transcendental is rationally prior and hence indispensable to knowledge, and the critical method is the finding of this indispensable condition. As a result, for the old dualism of mind and matter, Kant substituted a threefold world of subjective states, phenomena, and things in themselves. It was a list, and I did not know it. It was a list, a list, a list. As a result, for the old dualism of mind and matter, Kant substituted a threefold world of subjective states, phenomena, and things in themselves. The subjective area is no longer the domain of knowledge, but neither is a realm of things in themselves. Here is Kant's sharp break with the past. Things in themselves lie beyond us and so beyond all knowledge, unknown and unknowable. We cannot say what these things in themselves are, but we can say that they exist because they are a necessary postulate to experience. These are noumena, basic to the knowing process and therefore postulated, but beyond that their reality is neither to be affirmed nor denied, such a judgment is not possible. The basic realm is that of human knowledge, quote, the world of phenomena, end quote, or experience. Phenomena are not things in themselves, but things for us, reality as humanity experiences it, and as it... Reality as humanity experience it, experiences it, that's what, 
reality as humanity experiences it. Oh, color chobo. Reality as humanity experiences it, and as it is interrelated, and as it is interrelated, I'm going to have to squeeze my tongue for a while. Yes, 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 French. Here I am. I don't. I, I, I got to stop squeezing my tongue in public. Reality as humanity experiences it, and as it is interrelated. Thus, the attempt to correlate mind and matter, the knower and reality, is dropped entirely. It is not the correlation which constitutes knowledge, but the experience, the synthetic power of the mind, the unifying of human experience. Sensations give only raw material. Synthesis produces knowledge. It is not the result of combining experiences that is knowledge as much as the act of combining them. Thus, knowledge is constitutive, creative, interpretive, and the common ability of all humanity. While another order of beings might have a different power of synthesis and thus live in a radically different world than ours, yet the validity of knowledge is not thereby denied, because absolute reality is not the object of knowledge. Practically speaking, humanity can say, according to Kant, quote, the world is my representation, end quote. Such a suggestion hints of the pluralism which William James was subsequently to develop. Yet Kant also assumed to explain this capacity for synthesis and creative think. Let's try that again. Yet Kant also assumed to explain this capacity for synthesis and creative thinking a transcendental ego which is the postulate of all knowledge. It is the universal self, not an object of knowledge, but the virtual source of knowledge. The self, therefore, is the basic reality and hence not an object of knowledge. The universe and God are not objects of knowledge either, but for a different reason in that they are regulative principles and ideas and limiting concepts, basic to knowledge as such, and whose existence in themselves is not a question for knowledge, and hence neither to be affirmed or denied. Their status is as adjuncts to the transcendental ego. Thus, while Kant attacked empiricism and rationalism, his basic attack was on the concept of the ontological trinity, the self-contained God, Empiricism and rationalism had collapsed in their attempt to sever knowledge from dependence on God and hence Kant's hostility to them, because, for Kant's thinking, the severance was both basic and necessary. Ultimate reality is declared to be unknowable. We are so around We are surrounded by a brute factuality of which we are the cre creative. I'm just having trouble seeing. We are surrounded by a brute factuality of which we are the creative interpreters. Instead of trying to establish knowledge by relating mind and matter, Kant finds it in the world of experience, in the world of phenomena, in synthetic reason. While reality may or may not exist beyond man, it most certainly... It most certainly... Didn't come out, just croaked. It most certainly exists in man. The true self, the transcendental ego, is at least part, and possibly all, of that basic reality and thus, by nature, is the valid interpreter. The solution of Satan and Eve becomes steadily more explicit. Man seeks to solve, quote, the problem of God, end quote. Uh, just didn't have that flow, 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 flow. By becoming God in his own eyes. According to Van Til, quote, If Kant's position were to be retained... Both knowledge and faith would be destroyed. Knowledge and faith are not contradictories, but comp. 
I didn't expect the word complementaries. Knowledge and faith are not contradictories, but complementaries. Kant did not make room for faith because he destroyed the God on whom alone faith is to be fixed. It is true, of course, that Kant spoke of a God as possibly existing. This God, however, could not be more than a finite God since he at least did not or did not need to have original knowledge of the phenomenal world. Kant thought that man could get along with God in the matter... Oh, that wasn't... It didn't start well. <clears throat> Kant thought that man could get along with God in the matter of scientific knowledge. It is thus that the representational principle which we saw to be the heart of the Christian theistic theory of knowledge is set aside... If man knows certain facts, whether or not God knows those facts, as would be the case if the Kantian position were true, whatever sort of God may remain, he is not the supreme interpretive category of human experience. Hereafter, the notions of being, cause and purpose must stand for orderings we ourselves have made. They must never stand for anything that exists beyond the reach of our experience. Any God who wants to make himself known, it is now more clear than ever before, we have to do so by identifying himself exhaustively with his revelation. And any God who is so revealed, it is now more clear than ever before, will then have to be wholly hidden in pure possibility. Neither Plato nor as... For some reason I couldn't say the word Aristotle. Who knows? Aristotle! Pop, pop. Okay, I just lost the rag there. Lost the rag, lost the plot. Gonna have to do something about those sticky out cable ties. Which stick out, believe it or not. Which is the want of sticky out cable ties. It's their nature. It's their essence. Neither Plato nor Aristotle were entitled by the methods of reasoning they employed to reach the unconditioned. The unconditioned cannot be rationally related to man. There is no doubt but that Kant was right in this claim. Plato and Aristotle, no less than Kant, assumed the autonomy of man. On such a basis, man may reason univocally and reach a god who is virtually an extension of himself, or he may reason equivocally and reach a god who has no contact with him at all, nor will adding two zeros produce more than zero. End quote. When Kant said that man could have knowledge apart from God, he maintained thereby the self-sufficiency of the phenomenal world and of the self, and yet Kant could not make an absolute of the phenomenal world because it is the world of time which is itself subjective. Neither could he say that man's reason was valid for another order of being or inclusive of all possibility. Thus, neither the universe, the mind of man, or the phenomenal world gave man any absolute or any ground of validity for his knowledge. For Kant's arguments against Christian theism to be valid, quote, they must really be valid for all possible existence and thus be inclusive of the future as well as of the past. In other words, Kant needs an absolute in order to make his arguments effective. Accordingly, it is fair to say that Kant had to... Piece I don't need a drink, but I'm going to take one. A little tiny sip sip. Why did I hit the record button? Okay. Don't know why. I don't know why. Makes me cry. Accordingly, it is fair to say that Kant had to presuppose the existence of God before he could disprove it. It is thus that Kant had slain univocal arguments for the existence of God by a universal argument against such arguments and has, at the same time, killed all univocal reasoning. Mm -hmm. Just tripped over myself a little bit there. K. 
killed all univocal reasoning by showing that all univocal reasoning, including its own, presupposes analogical reasoning. As Samson died when he slew his enemies, so Kant died when he... Okay, I'm uh, just a little bit lost. Here we go. Try again. As Samson died when he slew his enemies, so Kant died when he slew his. End quote. The issues, as Van Til points out, have been greatly clarified as. as a The issues, as Van Til points out, have been greatly clarified as a result of Kant's work. Antitheism is insistent on interpreting reality in exclusively temporal categories and in rejecting any distinction between divine and human thought. Reasoning must be univocal. The ontological trinity is absolutely rejected as destructive of all history and reason. Christian theistic thought looms more clearly as the enemy of both pragmatism and idealism, both of which develop Kant's creativity of thought in their respective directions. It is clear from Van Til's analysis of the history of philosophy that the difference between Christian theism and anti-theism is not confined to the existence of God, but to the whole field of human knowledge. but to the whole field. Oh, oh dear. Oh, that was rubbish. Whole, whole. But to the whole field of knowledge. Instead of both sharing a common knowledge of the world and being in disagreement as to whether God exists or can and need be known, we have instead a radical disagreement as to the nature of all knowledge. Quote, Christian theism's fundamental contention is just this, that nothing whatever can be known unless God can be and is known. In whatever way we put the question then, the important thing to note is this fundamental difference between theism and anti-theism on the question of epistemology. There is not a spot in heaven or earth about which there is no dispute between the two opposing parties, but it is well, a good party in the west of Ireland, by in the county of Cork. There is not a spot in heaven or on earth about which there is no dispute between the two opposing parties. And it is the points that can bear much emphasis again and again. End quote. I wasn't happy with that. I was a bit of a... I was a bit homiletical. I was a bit... Again and again. End quote. It is this insistence that constitutes the originality of Van Til's insight as well as the offence of his position. The struggle, therefore, is one that covers the whole field of knowledge. It is precisely this that must be recognised as the basic issue. It is the Christian theistic conception that nothing can be truly known unless God can be and is known, and this discrepancy and disagreement between the contending philosophies is apparent as we consider the question of the object of knowledge. The object of knowledge is anything that is considered a fact, and here again the difference is obvious. What is a fact? Facts can belong to the physical world, to the realm of psychology, economics, mathematics and so on. But what is a fact? Each philosophy differs as to what constitutes a fact. The conception of the physical world and the facts thereof, very radically in Augustine, Spinoza, Hume and Kant, the quote-unquote facts vary from philosophy to philosophy, they are precisely the point of difference in that 
each begins with certain basic assumptions and presuppositions. Quote, what our opponents mean by the existence of any quote-unquote fact is existence apart from God. That they mean just this is indisputable for the reason that such existence apart from God is ipso facto predicated for all quote, quote, facts and quote, 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 fact, quote, 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 fact, end quote, except the quote, unquote, fact of God, if the quote, unquote, fact of God is called a question. For anyone to call the existence of God in question, he must at least exist and possibly exist apart from God. It appears then that the very connotation of the term existence is in question. The antithesis, the answer, oh, I wasn't happy with that last bit. It appears then that the very connotation of the term existence is in question. The anti-theist maintains that the term existence may be applied as a predicate to any quote fact end quote, even if the quote fact end quote of God's existence is not a fact. On the other hand, the theist maintains that the term quote existence end quote cannot be implied intelligently to any quote fact end quote unless the quote fact end quote of God's existence is a fact. In other words, the anti-theist assumes that we can begin by reasoning univocally, while the theist maintains that we cannot begin otherwise than by reasoning analogically. End quote. The denotation and connotation of any fact cannot be separated. Every fact is and is what it is and means what it means by virtue of its creation by... Every fact is and is what it is and means what it means by virtue of its creation by and place in the total providence of God and is not truly known on any other grounds. There are, Van Til points out, those who insist that it is intelligible to think of the non-existence of God but who, at the same time, insist that we cannot intelligently think of the non-existence of man in his world each begins with a reality, a basic fact, which he insists must be taken for granted. Van Til sees four positions as possible with regard to the question of existence and non-existence. First, we can believe it reasonable to doubt the existence of God, but not intelligible to doubt the existence of the universe. Second, we can doubt the existence of both God and the universe as the only intelligible step. Third, we can insist that it is not intelligible to doubt the existence of either God or the universe. Fourth, we may hold it possible to think intelligently of the non-existence of the universe, but impossible to doubt the existence of God. Of these four positions, I was expecting points, and I had to change mid-course to positions. Poor me. It's a hard life. Of these four positions, only the last is consistent with theism, not because Christianity denies the existence of the universe, but because it cannot consider the universe as the ultimate reality and therefore the ground of all thought. Without God, nothing can exist, and therefore God alone is the starting point of all intelligible thinking. A person's conception of what constitutes a fact is thus governed by his starting point, it is here necessary to distinguish with Van Til between an immediate and an ultimate starting point. He explains it by the analogy of a... I was seeing living, I was diving. I'll... He explains it by the analogy of a diving board. A diver, standing on the tip of a board and seeing nothing around him but water can state that the end of the board is his starting point in an immediate sense. But in an ultimate sense, the foundation of the whole board is his starting point and he cannot eliminate from his recognition of his situation 
all except the tip and the water? As Van Til insists, the question at issue in philosophy is, quote, not that of the immediate starting point. All agree that the immediate starting point must be that of our everyday experience and the quote-unquote facts that are most close at hand. But the exact charge we are making against so many idealists as well as pragmatists is that they are taking for granted certain temporal quote facts end quote not only as temporary but as an ultimate starting point end quote. Similarly, the Bible is not to be used as a source book in biology or to replace a paleontological paleo paleo paleontolog, paleontological paleo diet. Get ripped on the paleo diet, Paul. Paleontological. To replace a paleontological study in Africa, quote, the Bible does not claim to offer a rival theory that may or not. Let's bring that down a bit. The Bible, it's better. May or not may me may me me may me. The Bible does not claim to offer a rival theory that may or may not be true. It claims to have the truth about all facts. End quote. It is not claimed that one should go to the Bible instead of to Africa. What is claimed is that without the God of the Bible and the revelation therein given, no fact can be truly known nor can its existence even be posited. The opponents of Christian theism insist on taking for granted that specifically which they need to and cannot prove, the independence and ultimacy of the mind and of brute factuality. Moreover, all facts owe not only their existence, but their denotation and connotation to God, and every fact exists and must be known if it is truly known as a Christian theistic fact. Without the light of Scripture, no fact can be truly known. Not only facts, but all nature and history exist in terms of eternal categories. Christian thinkers like Augustine and especially Calvin have been ready to take the human self as the proximate starting point, while anti-theistic philosophy takes the self as an ultimate starting point. <clears throat> Gonna have to take a drink. Hokitoke. All the peoples. No, I'm not a member of the Illuminati. <laughs> no, I'm still not a member of the Illuminati. It's just that I'm hiding behind this thing. I promise. I'm not. I haven't been in MK Ultra. Honestly. Honestly. Look, I'm a normal person. All right. We're going to round off this paragraph and then <clears throat> bring this to a close. This. Ultimate starting point. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's a lot of gaseousness. Gaseous. <clears throat> <clears throat> this latter emphasis has become more consistently pronounced. Moreover, modern philosophy is less concerned with the object of knowledge than with the subject of knowledge, and the self is assumed to be the ultimate subject of knowledge. But the very challenge of Christian theistic philosophy, quote, is that God is the ultimate subject of knowledge. Man is and can be a subject of knowledge in a derived sense, because God is the subject of knowledge in an absolute sense. Theologically expressed, we say that man's knowledge is true because man has been created in the image of God. And for this reason too, there can be no dispute about the relative priority of the intellect and the feeling of man. Since the personality of God is a complete unity, 
so also the personality of man is a unity. End quote. The charge against all anti-theistic thought is that it is subjective, in that it sets up human thought or consciousness as the ultimate standard of truth. Because its concept of truth is derived from the mind or from experience, modern philosophy leads inevitably to a complete relativism in ex <laughs> Okay. Okay, just a little bit more. Modern philosophy leads inevitably to a complete relativism in epistemology and metaphysics. At times, it frankly forsakes the quest for truth and certainty, but it never candidly admits that the logical alternative is total relativism. In liberal theology, the same relativism is latent or explicit, and what passes for theology is little more than anthropology, and experience is emphasised as against truth or as the essence of truth. The sources of liberal and neo-orthodox theology are to be found in three main schools of philosophy. You see, I was assuming I, I was assuming that was going to be schools of thought. Ass so makes ass out of you, man. The sources of liberal and neo-orthodox theology are to be found in three main schools of philosophy. Again, see a mistake. It's so ingrained in my brain and makes me insane. The sources of liberal and neo-orthodox theology are to be found in three main schools of philosophy. All right, it's probably time for me to stop. The sources of liberal and neo-orthodox theology are to be found in three main schools of philosophy. First, in pragmatism, which assumes the subjective validity of all religion, irrespective of its object. Next are the naturalists, who emphasize logic rather than time, and reduce whatever God may be tolerated to a logical universal, binding together equally ultimate part. Wow. Easy peasy. binding together equally ultimate particulars. Last, we have the idealists, for whom God is the absolute, but a significantly empty absolute, in that the difference between God and man and time and eternity is erased by embracing all in a common and ultimate reality. Thus, all are equally ultimate, and God is a part of the universe rather than its creator and sustainer. God and man are alike aspects of reality. Therefore, God at best can function as an associate or elder brother, assisting man in the interpretation of reality he did not create and must himself struggle to understand. God becomes a logical necessity rather than creator. Man is as necessary to God as God to man, as witness the philosophy of Pringle Patterson. By a constant insistence on the co-relativity of time and eternity and God and man, idealism tries to gain for man and time a status in terms of ultimate reality. All are alike embraced in a common and ultimate reality. Not only is there a radical difference between Christian theistic thought and anti-theistic philosophy with regard to the starting point of knowledge, but also, as we have seen, over the question as to whether the existence of the object of knowledge can be taken for granted apart from God. Furthermore, in view of the sinful nature of man, the interpretation in terms of God must come through Scripture. Error is a result of sin, although not all error in logic is due to sin directly. Nevertheless, the mind of man is in rebellion against and in enmity to God and establish itself as its own God and own principle of interpretation. Man thinks cocoa fickle
Man seeks to think creatively rather than to think God's thoughts after him. Evil is a result of man's rebellion against and own principle of interpretation. No kalopacho patupopo. I probably want to stop now. I probably should stop now. Yeah, all right. Thanks for listening, folks. As always, uh, thank you for listening. If you want to support the work, s- send me a message. Give me a like. Give me a share. Give me feedback. Um, if you want to support the work financially to enable me to do more and better work, more better, then you can do so by going to where? At nathanteacher.com and clicking on donate to make a one-off or regular donatione. Thanks very much and hope to see you soon.